All right, here we go. And rolling sound, quiet. Here we go. Ready. And starting right on the lens. Ready. Okay. And, and action. Writer, producer, actor, you're a reti or retired musician. Which one I want? Which, which are you? What's which am I? Uh, actor. Actor, okay. Yeah. Um, finish this line. The arts are important because... The arts are important because... I feel like it's not going to make sense. We, the arts are important because uh, uh, we, need, we need identity, we need, uh, we need culture, we need uh, unity, we, you know, we, need, uh, we need color. Good morning, good day, or good evening, and welcome to 54 Lights. This show is meant to shed light on undertold stories out of Africa. Our vision is to introduce you to some extraordinary people doing incredible things, and to ultimately change the lens through which African and Africans are seen. My name is Kondwani Mwase, and today's episode is Center Stage. Today's conversation features my one-on-one -on -one chat with Dalmar Abuzaid. If you didn't know it, Dalmar's all but a household name inside and outside Canadian borders. His signature role was as Danny Van Zandt on the hit show Degrassi, The Next Generation. And as if it wasn't enough that he found his footing on that popular show, he's followed that up on yet another iconic Canadian series, having been cast as Sebastian Bash Lacroix on CBC's and with an E. I met Dalmar at his apartment in Toronto. He had just finished work on an episode of Anne with an E when he made time for 54. I was curious to know what it'd be like to spend time with a young man who'd made such inroads in his career. Would he be grounded? Intense? Welcoming? What I experienced in our hour-long meeting was the thoughtful perspective of a humble and hard-working professional. It's time. Let's go center stage with Dalmar. Here, in part, is our conversation. I went on to Baby Center. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked up Dalmar, yeah. and Dalmar on Baby Center says uh, that it means origin and or popularity. Then I went on to Baby Names Media, oh. and which I th I'm assuming is a lesser authority, and it said that <laughs> Dalmar means versatile. So yeah. I think, let me take a step back. Does it mean anything, or maybe you can give me your your full name? Yeah, and what if anything that means? So my name is Dalmar Fugoyo Abuzaid, and Dalmar, yeah, versatile is there. Uh, my mom's told me she always tells me world traveler. Okay, is what uh, is what the name means. Uh, Dal means world, and Mar means traveler. The language I always every time I ask her, it seems that I've misheard the language. Uh, so so I'm not positive on on what what language specifically but but world traveler is always the sense that i've had and versatility and what, what are the origins some somali name somali name. yeah okay. yeah delmar okay. is a somali name so anyone in uh in eastern africa like if we're talking uh djibouti somalia yeah everyone knows a delmar it's for uh, sure for sure know. uh abu zaid abu zaid is abu zaid? the yeah is the uh abu zaid is the is the tribe 
that my mom's and and grandmother's family, like the ancestry, the ancestry came. It was a, it was a, the Azande tribe in okay. the south of Sudan, which is where that name uh, comes from. Um, and so it's it's just a name in that uh, in that tribe. Very cool. And uh, a fugoyo is uh, what's is this idea of like sharing. Uh, I kind of don't know how it breaks down, but like I remember my mom telling me what's what's uh, I guess like what's someone's is someone else's kind of in the, in the spirit of sharing like what's mine is yours in that kind of sense I think is what uh, is my understanding of Fugoyo um, so that's my name yeah I typically ask this question a little bit afterwards in the in the interview but I feel like asking it now because you're an actor versatility sh- even sharing like sharing of yourself even though I, I'm, I'm making a huge leap here but do you feel your name is like do you feel like it's a perfect fit for, for who you are now? Um, yeah, yeah. I never kind of related it to acting, so funny. But um, I have always thought that versatility and adaptability and sharing and, you know, generosity have always been things that I'm proud to know that my name means. World traveler as well, because yeah. I, I don't, I, I'm not the, you know, I'm not the most adventurous when it comes to exploring and going somewhere new, but I but I really appreciate the value of traveling and learning about other people's way of life and other cultures, and I like to think that I am versatile and, and adaptable and, and all of that, so it's things that I'm proud of and it's things that are, are reflected in my name, so I've always kind of taken that as a point of pride. Have you ever considered changing your name? No, never considered changing my name. I've seen it happen. I've seen the reasons for it. I guess uh, there's just something in me that's, you know, not not out of, not, uh, you know, trying to defy or anything, but I just mm-hmm. never, it never occurred to me to change my name. I, yeah, I just think. This is who you are. This is my name. That's, yeah, that's Fantastic. it. No, I love it. And it, it, sorry, that question just came to me. And I was sort of, it's a good point. It's, no, it's, I, I've seen it happen. Some it. of my yeah. friends, yeah, who yeah. have changed their names, uh, you know, in order, because uh, there's the, you know, their name is either too hard to pronounce for a certain audience or it's uh it's uh they have a name that a lot of people have maybe and so they you know i have a friend who changed his first and last name i mean it's it's i guess it, it, the name translates to what it is now mm-hmm. in english from what it was before but he's yeah both but both he's sw- he swapped yeah both of them yeah mm-hmm. what does somalia mean to you it's it's not a very uh prevalent piece of my life growing up it's yeah un- unfortunately it's not that because uh that comes from my uh dad's side mm-hmm. and i'm i was never close with my father so i, I my mom raised me mm-hmm. here yeah you were born in toronto right born in toronto yeah, yeah she uh came from sudan um which i also have not been to and i wanted to go this year but uh you know with with the situation there and and planning it all out we've just decided to push it Growing up, I, I really was uh, immersed in the culture of Toronto, of, of, of I mean, Canadian culture. Mm-hmm. I, I grew mm-hmm. up in the East End in the beaches, and I went to, despite living in the beaches, I went to a French Catholic school. So there again, I wasn't really part of the beach community. I was yeah. in a French Catholic school in the beach community, and then went downtown uh, and, uh, and met uh, a lot more of a, of a diverse crowd when I went to high school. Um, and so... You know, growing up, my mom was obviously made uh, information about her culture and her heritage available to me. I think that I was much more, you know, concerned. And and she never kind of, it was never uh, imposed on me. So Mm -hmm. I feel like I really kind of gravitated to what was around me, which was this uh, Franco-Ontarian culture in a way, plus the friends that I was growing up with in my neighborhood. Um, So... So if anything, it was like some some Sudanese culture that is, has stayed with me and has been imprinted on me, and and uh, more than anything else, more than Somali culture, for example. Interesting. Interesting. Um, what got you into acting? Like what? Yeah, honestly, like I I was a I love being the person. You know, this kind of a, what do you call that? Like a, a bit of a contradiction where I wanted all of the attention and I wanted I wanted people to look at me. I wanted people to laugh at anything that I said. 
I, I, I love, I guess I was a bit of the class clown. Yeah. You know, I love that attention growing up. Uh, didn't know that acting was a thing. Spent a lot of time watching cartoons and just like, there was nothing greater than the feeling of escaping into a story or a story that kind of excited me. There was no greater feeling than that, that I can remember. Yeah. Like I, you, you know, you give me free time and I was like, I'm going to go into this portal into another world you know, and just lose, lose, and myself. lose myself and just <laughs> discover so many things that I didn't know. And it's endless. The possibilities are endless. So I, that idea was like a powerful thing for me when I was a kid. When I was 11, I, my, I, my cousin at the time, uh, who was older than me and so a bit of a role model for me, was hilarious. He was... Um, you know, just the life of the party. He could make me laugh all the time. I wanted to be like him. And uh, so he was in, he was acting. And I remember one day being at his place and uh, there was a commercial on TV. It was a commercial that he just, uh, that he shot. shot. Yeah. I mean, like we'll call it like months ago. It, might, it could have easily been months ago. And there it was on TV. Quick two seconds. He's like a... I don't know if it was like a, a fisherman's friend or something, like just like a throat lozenge commercial, and he's on a boat, and it looks like he's at sea, and he's like, uh, I don't know if, he's, if the ship is going down or what, but he just kind of salutes, um, and that was kind of it. And you kind of, it's black and white too, it was a black and white commercial, and, uh, and just like full grin and just salutes in, a, in what, you know, in, a, in his rain jacket. Uh, so he's at sea, and, and there's a storm anyways. And so that was on TV, he was just getting his paycheck for that commercial nice. that day. Nice. So I saw him open it, and he's like, yeah, I made, uh, I think it was like a 1000 or something dollars yeah. for that. And I was like, and at the time, I was uh, delivering newspapers. That was like my <laughs> part-time job when I was like 10 or 10, or 10 I think. Yeah, yeah. So you're like, this guy's rolling. Yeah, I was, I was making 100 bucks a month, and, and I'm looking at him like, one day... You were you played uh, Danny Van Zandt on Degrassi, the the uh, Next Generation. How did it, uh, you know, how did it feel to be part of such a like an iconic show? Uh, definitely didn't realize it at the time. Okay. I and even like, I would I'd even say that like it's it's recently and obviously in the years after, not even recently, yeah, the years after doing the show that I kind of understood the scope of it. When I, when I auditioned for Degrassi, I didn't know what it was. I didn't watch Degrassi. I was really... I watched cartoons for a long time. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I just didn't know. So, you know, and, and I remember kids in my school, in my elementary school... Have you done any voiceovers for cartoons? No, I've never done one. Say, I can't like, get a voiceover like, job. I don't know why. Just, and I'm like, I'm like, putting it out there. I want to be on a cartoon... Why haven't I done it until now? I haven't. It's an unrealized, uh, unrealized like, thing. Like, like now, kind of, like aspiration for you. Like, yeah, forget it. I want to. I want to be the voiceover. I'm sorry. It was the source. To <laughs> no, I just like it's just a funny point that's true. Like I just to this day. Um, so I, uh, I, I didn't. You know, kids in my elementary school were like, "Oh, what if you got on Degrassi one day?" And I thought, I don't know, really, what that is. And and so I remember getting the audition. It was I had auditioned for it twice, and it was the second time that they ended up giving me this part of Danny Van Zandt. I'd auditioned for the principal's son, which didn't make sense because the principal couldn't be my dad, different, you know, different ethnicity. Yeah. So what they, because, and I, I think they hadn't cast the principal at the point yet. So they, they were still looking to kind of build this family. So I didn't, they, they you know, I didn't end up being that, but they liked me enough to give me this other part and make me the brother of uh, Sarah uh, Barable Tishauer, who was uh, Liberty. So that was uh, a month after. I remember I was I was playing outside. My mom called me. It's like you know she would go to the backyard and I'd be like a couple of yards over and she would just kind of yell yeah. and I would hear and then I would you just then I just the call. run back, yeah. run down the street and then to the house and that was when uh, I you know had a wardrobe fitting and that was really the start of like understanding what it meant to be on set and all of the uh, the ins and the outs. You know it was like so, it's just like a, a whole new world basically for yeah. me. And, uh, and so it was, uh, I remember doing the first season, uh, the uh, one episode had come out. I had maybe one scene in the episode. I went to my cousin's place in, uh, they lived in the South of California. Okay. And I went to their school, their middle school, and I got 
swarmed for like autographs. Yeah, I was gonna say like, this must have been. This was like yeah, this was like 2004, and I got swarmed. I remember, and like I, yeah, it was nuts. I, I that was when I kind of that was the first time anything like that had ever happened to me. Was was that your signature role in terms of turning the the corner in your career? If that's yeah, yeah, it like, was without realizing it, but yeah, it was because I. It ended up being a job, a role that I did for six years. It became a norm, and I and and I didn't quite understand it as like a as like a as like my job job at the time. I think, but it was like what I was used to, and I and I kind of got my understanding of what it was to be on a set. Made you know my close friends there. I met Ray there. Yeah, nice. So, so that was uh, definitely a turning point because it was after coming out of that that I did that I was starting to make the decision that I was going to make acting my job. Is it as number after, one? Yeah, number one. And it was once the show was com- like I was completely done on the show and had gone through years of like uh, a, a bit of a tough stretch of like not really working mm-hmm. after that and not and not being aware that that was kind of the ups and uh, that's what the yeah. nature of the business a little bit, right? Yeah. Can you tell me about? Sebastian Bash Lacroix. He is a uh, a coal trimmer um, from Trinidad. He meets Gilbert uh, on a steamship where Gilbert has been working and has decided to yeah start working uh, after leaving at the end of the first season to kind of find himself and discover you know what there is to life out there. Yeah. And, and I've been on this ship now for ten years, so there's about that much. Uh, time of a difference in age between me and Gilbert, mm-hmm. uh, between Sebastian and Gilbert. So Sebastian is a coal trimmer, which is the the guys that would feed coal to the steam engines at the turn of the century, at the uh, at the nineteenth uh, century, twentieth uh, century, and uh, so Sebastian comes from Trinidad. He's like a a charming, you know, what do you want to call it, like a you know, full of energy, you know, good natured. Uh, hardworking, um, you know, likes to laugh, but a very like a strong character as well. Like a very yes, he's got uh, dreams. He's got very strong dreams, yeah. and like he, you know, the idea behind his backstory is that he left his home at the age of seventeen to make a living for himself, and 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 uh, aspires to to you know he's got he's got dreams, and he wants yeah. to and and concrete dreams that he wants to kind of reach. He wants to make a a name for himself, have a life for himself, and not be, uh, not have to to serve anyone at that time, which was a very radical idea. For sure, for sure. I've got a couple questions on uh, on him, and and obviously your portrayal of him. Uh, I'll start with the lighter one, though. Is I, I heard of it in another interview that you picked up the Trini accent. Is that oh, sorry? I, I don't know if that's true, but I yeah. think it is by. Taping your friend is that? Yes, right. Yeah, totally. I uh, I have a friend who is Trinidadian. When I got the audition, I had two or three days to basically drill this accent yeah. because they the breakdown said excellent accent. Yeah, that's why. That's why I was like, wait a minute. They don't give you lead time for this, do they? Or no, like it really is a matter of like the part of it is like they'll find the person because the person will be will you know that will be part of the person that they end up choosing really yeah. kind of thing and it's like if you you either can do it or you can't but the person that they're going to choose they want to see that so i thankfully got uh, a bit of i think i would say probably a day extra than what of, of notice maybe from my agent and i had a friend that i immediately thought of asked him funny enough this friend uh, a few actors in the city know him so he was kind of that week, I think he might be like going around and being like, sure, I'll help you out. Sure, I'll help you out. He just had to offer his services suddenly. And uh, so I the most basically... Guy in town yeah, he suddenly time. became a popular kind of resource. Um, so I, I asked him to... Rec- I recorded... I had him record all of my lines. And then I went and did the work, obviously, of like figuring out what the scene was and kind of mapping out what I had... A, what I wanted to do. Yeah. And then I was trying to... to get the accent to a place where it was it felt natural so i learned the accent from his kind of i I asked him some questions about uh my friend my friend uh, his name is mix um i asked him 
I asked him questions about his life. I asked him questions about the script. He was able to point things out. And because it was being, the, the script was be, uh, was written by the team, but it, but, uh, inspired by a uh, Shernal Edwards, who is a uh, Trinidadian. Um, it was all things that were true and, and part of the Trinidadian. It was often custom in within the script. Yes. Yes. Uh, that he was able to recognize and kind of inform me about like this. Oh yeah. This is what, uh, this is what this dish is like. Mm. This is what, uh, that's a funny line there. Yeah, yeah. I would say something like that. And then, you know, I recorded all of, I recorded all of, the, of what, you know, even the conversations that we were having, because then it's nice to see, what it's like when he's just speaking versus yeah. what when he's reading. Right. So, uh, yeah, I got him to, to help me out with that. And then uh, I studied it and tried to... I basically just had the time to listen to his voice. And then after that, I would try to get as many resources as I can. I would try to, yeah, find the accent anywhere. The whole process of immersing yourself in a character, learning the lines, the, the all of the that cadence, and then on top of that, you got to pick up a, an accent that isn't yours yeah so is that the hardest thing or is, is something else the hardest thing like um it's it's a concrete thing the accent you know like you hear it and i think i'm my my own worst critic because i um, i'm always like no not quite no not quite but it's a concrete thing and so when i feel that i have when i f- it's it's a very kind of like not black and white but a thing that i'm like yes okay there it is that sounds good that feels good and sometimes it can have an effect of like informing the performance as well. And so it kind of serves to help. I'm able to do things when I'm do when I have the accent that I wouldn't have thought of or wouldn't have had the instinct to do if I wasn't doing the accent. So I'm kind of grateful for that. It, it, it definitely kind of uh, weaves itself with, the, with my performance. Um, it's not the hardest. It's not the hardest thing. No, like at, at first it's a lot of like, it takes a lot of my attention. It took a lot of my attention in preparing for it. Um, but then as I go on, is the question is like understanding the scene and it feeling authentic to me. I think that's the thing that I'm always chasing when I'm when I'm doing a scene. And so the accent, the the outfit, the the setting, they are all huge help. They're they're all a huge kind of asset to me in kind of going for that truth of whatever the moment is mm-hmm, mm-hmm. is your character because um this is sebastian is that character more important for black audiences white audiences oh, wow. you know and, and the reason i'm asking that is just because and, and i like i i hadn't really watched uh, and of green gables like the the, the original, the original yeah. I, nor had I read the book and all that it's based on or any of the spin-offs. Um, and maybe partially because there was no representation of me in there. Mm. Uh, partially, let's say. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so as, as your characters emerged as a, like as a new thing in the whole series, like this is a, a watershed moment, I'm like, it just struck to me the other day and I was like, is this more important for black people or more important for like black people, yeah. people of color? Yeah, or is this yeah. more important for white, white audiences to see this other perspective? Um, and I, like I have my own answer, but it doesn't matter. Like what's your answer to that? Yeah. I, uh, I had, uh, I had never thought about it from that point of view, like more important for, for an audience other than, than a black audience. Like I never thought about it from that point of view, but I think that that is true. Yeah. Because you know, it, it it's, introducing something that that i think it was like a for example like a, a the community in the bog is historically true and were it not for introducing me in this way in this celebrated story i don't think that people would it wouldn't be on the front of people's minds it wouldn't be they wouldn't be reminded of it because mm-hmm. i i even was not kind of aware that there was this community that existed um and kind of bashed helps to to shine a light on that which i think is important and and i as well did not watch and i didn't grow up with it um i grew up with uh, another show which was a cartoon pippi longstocking which i think was influenced mm-hmm. by anne of green gables because the character is an orphan and she's yeah. got braids so this this idea made sense to me and and obviously uh i was not as familiar with it i think it's so it's such a great thing to 
have a story and then kind of expand it in such a way that people feel invited into this into this uh into this story i think that that's so important and, and i kind of had not separated i was like for a black audience though or for a white yeah, audience it's a bit and i don't yeah. know that it's black and white but you know, yeah. you know like literally that but it, you know it, it is interesting because now like i feel like oh like it just didn't i i'm obviously i had to interview you so i was like okay let me let me let me really kind of really understand this show and then i was sort of like had this not happened had I not had an interview with you I don't know that I would have ever even looked at that show mm. again had it not been, even been for Nality's involvement in it and mm. then I'm like oh there's a there's a whole world being exposed now through Dalmar that now I'm like maybe I would have yeah so that's my curiosity and then I'm thinking of quote unquote white households mm -hmm. and their education now because this is historically accurate as well mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so anyways that's that's the, the the genesis of the question yeah i've had uh you know actors you know actors that i that i respect in the industry that have kind of been at it for longer than me that have come and said it to me like one one in particular that i'm thinking of who said that he's happy that uh you know there is a character that he sees on his on this show that he could sit down and watch with his family that that and and he's seeing representation mm -hmm. and he says that uh that's such an important thing for him and, and him telling me that i kind of you know was, was super happy because and and proud of, of that kind of that moment um and and yeah so so it's it's uh it's it's so important and and i think that a lot of people have are, are appreciative of that i know that some people would like the story to have remained the same, but uh, I, I just think that it was it, this idea of expanding the universe of a story that already exists is so exciting to me, and I and it's and, and that's because of uh, yeah, that's because I can appreciate you know what it means for for everyone, kind of more people coming together. It's like there's a wider audience that can right. identify with this story of what it is to be Canadian. And I think that that's a great uh, message. How much of, um, I'm, I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent here, but how much of you is in the roles that you've played? Like, do you bring yourself there or is it sort of like, no, I'm, I'm all Sebastian or do you say, no, I can call it like, how much of that is yeah. you? Yeah, it's, I think that there, yeah, I'm, I'm a believer that it's all kind of like, it's just sides of myself and, and I really got to do the work of like revealing it and, and developing it and fleshing it out and making it more than just a two dimensional thing. You know, that's, that's part of why I'm also in classes so that, so that I've got more depth and, and more room in, 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 in if, if I'm playing a character, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, but I've always kind of, since I, for as long as I can remember, think that I'm just bringing a side of myself. I'm just revealing, or I'm just showing you what I look like you know, under this circumstance, because that's kind of that's that's what I know. That's what I know. That's that's what I can offer. Um, and you know, it, it it it's great when it's a side of myself that I don't recognize, and it's a side of myself that that other people don't recognize because yeah. it helps me to kind of transform and. And those sides of myself sit in different places. And obviously I'm not going to show, I, I want to be, you know, like I am now, I want to be positive and in a good mood and, and, uh, and open and, and friendly, but maybe the side of myself that's kind of like reserved and, and, uh, uh, closed off and, and, uh, and upset and bitter is something that I might need to become familiar with and, and, and and show and let people see mm -hmm. in order to in order to kind of uh, uh, reflect a different character, That's a different role, a yeah. different role. So yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. So I'm, so you're you're in there. So uh, it's me. Yeah, it's yeah. always me. Is what I feel like. My favorite actor is. Hmm. My favorite actor, uh, I, I really, you know, I really admire Idris Elba. Uh, I really admire his uh, career and I really admire the, the person I see, you know, in, in interviews and in movies. I, I really like Idris Elba. Fantastic.
so but but uh, so my favorite guilty pleasure is oh uh <laughs> my favorite guilty pleasure these days it's ice cream is it yeah it's like i it's like i have an appointment with ice cream <laughs> every day and i never miss it uh, all right okay okay guys, like i eat just so that i have a, an excuse to have a, a dessert uh, that's it nice And I think you've done all of these, but the theater, mm-hmm. TV, media, uh, TV miniseries, uh, or movies, because you've also... Uh, I've, I've never, like, uh, you know, done long-term movies. Okay, rap fire. A, a, t- a TV miniseries, I think. TV okay. is, like, my, my jam. Okay. Um, same question, but what's the toughest? Uh, probably theater. I think that it's such a, a demanding and, and uh, all-encompassing and... and uh, you know, you really need to you you need to have autonomy as an actor to kind of handle where you're gonna go, investigate what your character wants, remember what the story is, and deliver and be present every moment. There's like a demand that you need to do that. So there you have it. The conversation continues. I'd like to thank my guests for their participation and candor. Audio for this episode was mixed with the support of our producer, John Kitt, and partly recorded at Corner Studios in Toronto. Music for this episode was composed, played, and enjoyed, with permission, by Anjo. Remember to find us wherever you do your listening. We're on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. Listen, like, share until we meet again thanks for listening